three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Nine Finger Chronicles podcast. And we're continuing our conversation about habitat improvement, habitat management today with my good buddy out of Pennsylvania, Mitchell Shirk. Mitch, man, how you doing? Hanging in there, Dan. Thanks again for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those of you guys who are listening, you can't see this, but he's got a bear rug hanging in the background of the of his uh, computer screen there. And <laughs> do you bear hunt every year? Yeah, I've bear hunted every year since I'm 12 years old uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, I've been fortunate enough that one you're looking at right there, I actually shot that when I was 13 years old. It's kind of a funny story. I'll make it short. Uh, you know, you're supposed to have a, an, a mentor or an adult with you when you're hunting up until 16 years old. Yep. And I, I always hunted in a camp with multiple guys and we make uh, make bear drives in some really rough terrain. And this, the first year I went, I sat with my dad and the second year they're like, <clears throat> you want to sit by yourself? Me being me, I'm like, yeah, sure. And the first year I sat by myself, I shot a bear and then had to tell the stories to the game wardens. And they're like, kind of sounds like you were sitting by yourself. No, 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 that wasn't. <laughs> but anyway, that was neat. I, uh, I, shot a, I, I shot one when I was in college in Pennsylvania. And I kind of didn't get real gung ho about bear hunting then for a while, but now I'm probably as much into bear hunting now as I am deer hunting. Um, and I, I, I killed one last year in New Jersey when they reopened their season with the bow. I'm going to do that again this year. So yeah, I, I really enjoy bear hunting. Man, that's something that I, I don't know about it yet. I've never done it, so I don't understand it. Right. And so, you know, the whole, the whole baiting part of it is, I, I don't know, maybe a little bit muddy water for me. Yeah. Uh, again, never done it. I'm not going to cast any kind of judgment on it, but sitting over, uh, uh, you know, a pile of Rice Krispie treats or whatever it is that, you know, the big loaves of bread or the bait piles that you guys have. I don't know if it, uh, if that would do it for me, but here's what I've heard. And that, and that is that, guys have the same feeling going into it but when the bear shows up and they it it completely changes your your attitude towards that style of hunting because it's such like an incredible animal and just getting that close to it is is with all their senses that they have is just like a white tail buck right i mean getting mm -hmm. that close to something is is success in itself well, and the other thing too, it's unique. So Pennsylvania, we cannot bear hunt or uh, yeah, bear hunt. We cannot bait. It's not mm -hmm. legal to bait bear in Pennsylvania and <clears throat> you cannot use hounds in Pennsylvania. So you are hunting them based off of food sign. And if you're gun hunting, you know, guys will make drives for the guns, but uh, New Jersey, they used to allow baiting for bear and New Jersey is a state where you can bait for deer, even on public land. But uh, they made it that you're not legally allowed to sit within 300 feet of a bait site while bear hunting. So really, when it comes to how I bear hunt, I've never hunted on bait. I don't I don't do anything other than uh, scout, look for food, look for sign, look for cover. And I, I basically deer hunted for bear. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really fun. It's I mean, I've gotten excited over some big deer I've killed. I get every bit as excited, if not more, when a bear comes in. So yeah, it's a it's a good time. Yeah. Um, are you guys allowed to use dogs or hounds up in Pennsylvania? No, 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 no hounds in in this part. Um, I think when you get into New England states, you can, and of course, yeah. when you get into Virginia and Carolinas, you can. But Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the two states I'm bear hunting in, and and even New York, you, no hounds are allowed. Yeah. That that to me seems wild like i don't see the interest like i don't at this point like i said i don't have the interest to sit over uh, a box of lucky charms and wait mm -hmm. for and you know and wait for bears but what does interest me and it seems like this gigantic adrenaline rush would be to follow hounds in the out west or somewhere and have you know listen to the hounds track down the bear trim and then go do that that seems like just a, a huge rush or, or a mountain lion or some other predator yeah well and i think just like deer hunting bear hunting has its own 
um, interest groups, so to speak. I mean, you've got, yeah. think about whitetails. You've got guys who love private land management and habitats, and they're going to hunt on their, you know, manipulated properties versus the guy who's knocking on doors permission or, you know, I'm strictly public land bow hunting, or I like to hunt with a group of guys in rifle season, make tries. It's the same thing with bear hunting. Like, I know uh, uh, conversing with some friends I have in Virginia, like you're you're considered like taboo, I guess, if you shoot a bear while you're deer hunting in the woods and a bear comes along. Like you're not a bear hunter in that case. A real bear hunter goes in with hounds and it's like to each their own, do what you want to do. But right. I mean, the, the hound thing, I, I think it would be cool to experience. But, you know, you talked about not having much interest in the bait side of things. It's kind of how I am with the hounds. I have no problem with anybody who does it. And I kind of like to experience it. But just doesn't really it's not like it doesn't trip my trigger yeah again i'm not going to pass judgment on anything exactly that, in, until i act, actually do it exactly. um, i will i will say this i went to a high fence operation down in texas um and i can say that if i was deer hunting down there i mean it was it was a fun unique experience and i'm glad that i did it however it definitely like i i will never I shouldn't say never because maybe there's maybe something different happens. You know, when I get older, I change my mindset because we all change and, um, and maybe I would do it in a, like 20 years from now or something. I, maybe, I don't know. Right. But as of right now, like any type of high fence deer hunting has, I have zero interest in it at all. You and me now, both buddy. With the exotics that we hunted there, I shot, I shot, I shot uh, a giant, ostrich looking bird uh what's it called uh, uh rhea they're oh. called they're called rias and so i shot a gigantic ostrich when i was down there and <laughs> and i was like okay that happened that's cool would i ever pay money to go do it again no i probably wouldn't but it was definitely a unique experience and i it was more about who i was with not what i was doing at that point yeah, again, I, I I try not to to pass judgment on anything because um, there's somebody bigger for judgment cases. But when it comes to the high fence hunting, too, I mean, uh, I've heard stories of high fence situations where animals were so tame and, you know, they had it lined up for somebody mm -hmm. to come hunt it. And the week before they peppered stuff with paintball guns. So that way it was a little bit more wild. It's like just stuff like that just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't interest me. That's crazy. Oh, man. Um, I do have to ask you, uh, oh, I'm in a weird mood this morning. All right. And I, I got to ask makes two of us. Yeah, I know. I, I need to ask you a question and because this has been something that is on my mind a lot recently, and that's the word happiness. Okay. And I'm kind of curious, what are, what are things in your life? that make you happy. You said you wanted to make this a habitat and deer hunting. Yeah, I know, I know. I don't know if we have we'll time to go down that rabbit hole, dude. <laughs> we'll get um, there. We'll get there. So, so, I, so you, you say that I'm in this like weird, I don't know if it's necessarily a crossroads. I'm just at this weird point in my life where I'm like standing back and reevaluating everything that's got me to here and mm -hmm. i have to ask myself that question a lot what makes me happy um so i i guess to lay the foundation for that i mean i'm uh, i got two kids four and two mm -hmm. um you know I'm, I'm fairly new to the dad thing i'm fairly new to the husband thing um i've got a, a great career but it's becoming more demanding of my time and this and that and like truly what makes me happy is solitude in the woods i mean i want to do everything hunting that i possibly can but the reality is where the strings are pulled um i've done like next to nothing as far as hunting for the 2024 season this year yeah. mm -hmm. compared to normal and trying to find purpose and trying to find what makes me happy throughout seasons of my life that has been an extremely difficult thing for me to navigate mm -hmm. um so i i can truthfully say what right now what makes me the happiest of all is um watching my boys grow i mean yeah. like i can't I, I can't believe the level of 
love and happiness that two little people can bring me, even though at the same time, I wanted to throw them through the freaking wall when they won't let me sleep at night. <laughs> like, like it's, 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 how can the something truth, that dude. frustrates you so much that you love exactly. so much, but like, you know, we've had some good weather this week. So, um, one of the things I enjoyed when I got home from work, my wife went and did field hockey practice. I took the boys to the park and my, my four-year-old, he was actually, when we had some nice weather, he was already riding his bicycle without training wheels at three. Mm -hmm. So now like mm -hmm. I can take him out and just let him go and seeing like we got him a new bike for Christmas or uh, for his birthday. And he's riding this bike around ripping on it. And he's like, thank you so much, daddy. I'm like, honestly, that's truly what makes me happy. Um, deer hunting and bear hunting and all the stuff that we talk about on a podcast. I love that stuff, but man, it, I never thought I'd say this, but there's a sense it's getting less important or, or it's just shifted. It's still important to me, but the things that were important about it are now different. I don't know if that makes sense yeah. or not, Dan. No, it makes a hundred percent sense because I have that same, those same thoughts right now in my life. Like I'm to the point where, man, I've done hunting. Right. I, I, not all types of hunting, but when it comes to whitetails, the rut, man, I've done it for a long time now. And if there's a soccer game or a football game or a baseball game or some kind of event that my kids are participating in, man, and I have to choose between going hunting and hanging with my kids, even if there's nothing to do, even if there's nothing to do, I'd rather hang with my kids than go hunting. And that that may be crazy for someone who is as passionate about hunting as I am, but my family is first for me by miles. And second is hunting. The cool thing about it is, you know, you can involve your family into your passion and getting your kids outside and, and all that stuff. But it's really like, I, it just, it, Every year, it tends to matter a little bit less and a little bit less for me. So I got a question to ask you then on that very topic. So when you think about what we just talked about, kids making us happy and mm -hmm. our passion in the outdoors, one overwhelming theme that I've noticed, whether it's hosts I've had on my show or listen, if I've listened to another podcast, is there's definitely a difference in where you're at hunting-wise based on the external pulls you have outside of hunting. Mm -hmm. Like, are, do you have a family? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? Do you have a job? What's your time constraints like that? I, I'm just curious, like when you think about hunting industry in the media, like you get that big macho man, I'm a big buck killer, whatever I am. Do you notice that same thing or that same trend within who's talking about what aspects of hunting? I don't know if I worded that in a way that makes sense, but like, do you, do you experience anything like that with like people being at different places in their life causes them to talk about hunting in a different light? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I do that. My, I do that myself. Yeah. And, you know, kind of going back to a, a episode that I had with Justin Zara recently, I, made some comments about 25 year olds, right. That yeah. didn't go over, didn't go over very well. And, and basically what, what I, what I was getting at was, uh, and, and again, this was a, a social media clip that I posted and the people who were kind of, uh, did that weren't going along with it. Didn't listen to the whole podcast. They just listened to the clip that I posted on social media and it, it pissed some people off basically saying like, you know, age has nothing, nothing to do with it. Where in my opinion is I was 25 once and I was completely gun ho on hunting. And I, I had, you know, when I was 25, I had about 12 years of hunting experience. Now that experience doesn't mean much to me. Like I, and, and, because really when I was 26 is when I really started taking things serious. So experience, my experiences for the, the first 10 years versus the second 10 years were completely different, right? Uh, when it comes to, if I'm going to compare my entire, break down my entire 20 plus years of hunting experience, what's that, what does that mean? Okay. Right. And so. But I will tell you this, in 2016, I thought one way about hunting and strategy 
and things like that when I was, you know, when I was shit, 36, 36 years old. Now I'm 42 and I look at it, I look at things differently. So what I'm getting at is, you know, experience, there's no real definition for what makes somebody an expert. Like it, having experience and being an expert at something are two completely different things, if you ask me. And so, yeah, a 25 year old can have, you know, ex have 20 years of experience hunting, but they don't have 40 years of experience, you know, like, and I'm sure out there, there's a 60 year old listening to me talk about hunting and going, this guy doesn't know shit yet. Yeah. Right. Because time it's different for everybody. There, there's, there's a Dan Johnson out there right now who, who has already done what I've done and he's done what I'm about to do. And he has a different take on like, he thinks I'm young and he thinks I'm green. You know what I mean? And so it's just, it's really difficult for, for, I don't know, like I think, and the whole thing was based, based off of taking advice from others. Like, like, I, you know, I, I, I made a comment about a 25 year old interviewing another 25 year old uh, on a podcast about hunting strategy. And I just kind of, I, I kind of giggled at that because I'm like, Hey man, what's a 25 year old going to tell me that I don't already know. Right. right. And so really what it comes down to is their experiences. And that specific example, the, the 25 year olds did not have a lot of experience. Now, again, I will say this, that the 25 year old that reached out to me had a ton of hunting experience, right? And we're, we had a conversation with each other and we're going to have another conversation with each other, not, not on a podcast. Just, I told him, Hey man, let's talk about it. Because if you just, if you just say a comp, uh, if you make a comment and don't care where it goes and someone else disagrees with you, well, that's kind of ignorant on my part if I would do something like that. So I want to, I want to know where this guy's coming from. I want to know what, what he has to say. And, and that to me is very important in, in communicating with other people within the industry and within this community. Well, context is everything, regardless exactly. of what aspect of life and where you're describing it from. But yeah, so one of the things I thought about, because, you know, where I'm at, like I got married fairly young, kids fairly young. And I was at the, like, when I got married, I was at, in my mind, the peak and, and I'm, I'm starting to get the snowball rolling. I'm getting better. I'm, I'm doing things better. I'm, I'm, I'm gaining traction in aspects of hunting and, um, call it young and stupid but the the train slowed down quite a bit with those things and even though i guess That's life I, man it is and i knew it was going to happen but i didn't I, I guess i mentally wasn't prepared for it so i went through this whole process of of you know what we're just talking about and then i'm thinking to myself too when you think about hunting media because like how, how do you is there a way to like help people that listen be like, look, mm -hmm. this is what you have in into process. Like, if you're gonna go down this rabbit hole, you're gonna go down the 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 way of kids and wife and and career and this and like, like you, you should curb your expectations this way. Or, or I don't know. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just think maybe we just gotta learn the hard way. I don't know. <laughs> and then that's how I learn. That's how I've learned everything. I mean, if you want to talk about deer hunting strategy the way that i learned and i've dude, this is this is a topic that i've been talking about for 10 years now right the nine finger chronicles podcast has been up and running this is the 2024 is the 10th year that i've been doing this and learning from failure has been the motto of this podcast because with not only my experiences but everybody that i've talked to about it and and like it sucks going through it but i can look back now x number of years later and i can say holy shit i needed that i yeah. needed that failure to get to get me where i'm at if i was i don't know if i was if i if i didn't do it and i just kept going in and going well, and throwing excuses at why i'm not killing deer well that's a that's a loser's mentality and i can't i'm not going to do that and so in order for me to to find success, I had to have failure 
in order to go, okay, well, I can't set up here because the thermals are doing this, or I can't set up here because the wind, once it goes into this terrain feature, it swirls and kind of comes back around, you know, all those, all you throw a, a million examples out there right now. And so, I don't know. It's just, life is funny, man. It is. It really it is. is. It is frustrating. Like, I, it's crazy. What I, One thing that I have tried to do uh, as far as my personal hunting career over the years, I have tried to, and I think you used the term here, like curb my expectations. Yeah. To, to the point where I want to go out. I want to have a good time. I'm not worried about what other people think of the deer that I shot. I don't want to, th I don't care about what other people think of the strategy that I use or where I hunt and, and things like that. Right. And so I just, I go out, I hunt my hunt. And if I shoot a deer, man, I shoot a deer, but I, I'm going to have fun regardless of, of what the outcome is. And so I, uh, it's just, I don't know, man, it, it's less about the destination and more about the journey. And I mean, that's a meme right there, right? It is, but that is so accurate. So it, it's like you just talking about doing you and keeping happy. That's mm -hmm. all that matters. And let's face it. I hunt for Mitchell and Dan hunts for Dan and you don't, we don't do it for anybody else. And right. I have that exact same mentality and philosophy. However, I, I will be the first to admit it wasn't always that way for me. There was a time oh, where I was, yeah, and I'm sure you experienced that where there was a time I was concerned about this and I was concerned about that. And that is just, that's got so many problems, dude. There's a uh -huh. lot of problems for that. And one of the flaws that I've found with that, whether it's the podcast myself or other people that are in that same part of their hunting life or career, if that's something they do, like I've noticed it when it comes to like strategy podcasts or people talking like it's almost like they, they got to they got to prove something to themselves and talk. And I hear conceptual things. of just like I call BS. Like I, I feel like we're just we're just talking to impress somebody. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't care about it. I just want to do what makes me happy. And I tell yeah. you what, that makes me a lot happier. So yeah, maybe that's 100%. the answer to your question. <laughs> what would they what's the comparison is the thief, the thief of joy comparing yourself to others. And I will say this, when I started, like I loved deer hunting before 2006, right? I enjoyed going out and hunting turkey and deer. And then I became a psychopath in 2006 where I just dove into deer hunting, okay? Bow hunting specifically. And, but I told myself when I get to a point, well, let me take a step back. In 2006, I started filming and do creating content for white knuckle productions i'm not sure if you're familiar with with uh like todd pregnance and that whole crew and i was one of the early like one of the first guys in that whole crew and i said to myself right then i said if this stops being fun for me then i'm gonna quit that's the only that's that's the only thing and for a while there it stopped being fun and so that led to some of the reasons why I stopped filming for, for that, for that, not, not all the reasons, but one of some of the reasons. And so I did a season, it was like 2004, 13 and 14. I, I did some seasons there where I just hunted. I wasn't successful. Um, I was chasing one deer. Uh, no, wait, he was dead by then. Uh, I, I, I was 2013. I got skunked cause I was, you know, chasing a, a single buck 2014 i believe i dedicated not an entire season but some of my rut hunt to one of my buddies um i i made a deal with him hey you come film me because he was living in missouri at the time i was saying you come film me and then i will trade you if if you come film me for however many years until you draw an Iowa tag you can come hunt my farm and i will then film be the camera guy behind it so 2014 uh for you know for about a week or so we got uh we we did it like i dedicated in my season towards him and then i didn't shoot a deer i didn't shoot a deer in 2015 um i think that's when my 
Yeah, that's when my other son was born. So that he was born in April. And so that was difficult to get away at, at that point. But um, I, I don't even remember what we were talking about. We're just talking about the <laughs> journey because the oh, journey yeah, and the process the, is big. Right, right, right. And so, like, to me, it has to be fun, right? Because if I treat what I'm doing now as I, because I'm getting to the point, I, like, I don't want to say burnout, but I'm getting to the point after 10 years of doing this where there's days where I'm not having as much fun as I used to be having creating content. And, and it, it's now, it's now a business and it's now how I uh, feed my family. And so now it's a job. Right. And so now I have to treat, I have to make decisions now. Like when I had, when I was doing this and I had another job, I could say, ah, this isn't cool. I'm not going to do it. But now I have to make decisions based off of what's going to get me money. I mean, this is, this is the truth, right? What gets me money is doing certain things. And yeah, it may not be fun or like exciting for me, but I have to do it in order to continue the path that I'm on and continue being self-employed, right? Because now I have this family and now I have to make payments out of my company for my house, for my bills, all that stuff. So it, ha- it takes on, a, it takes on a whole different feel and you have to make, you have to make sacrifices and decisions just like in, anywhere else in your life. You absolutely do. The the journey is the thing. And Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, I'm growing better at not Mm -hmm. looking at the end goal of filling a tag or whatever that would be. I'm trying to enjoy the process it takes to get there because that's where the true enjoyment has. My wife makes fun of me all the time because people say, you know, I I shot a buck this year and pretty early. Like, Oh, are you you content now? Are you happy? And my wife answered in that stage. She's like, no, he's never happy because he's, because now he's done. And I was like, well, that's because I like hunting. It's not really the kill I like. And you think about when you say a statement like that, then what do you enjoy? And I enjoy everything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really looking forward. I think the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to now, believe it or not, is this upcoming turkey season. Uh, I never thought I'd hear Dan say that. I know, right? I know, right? People are rolling over in their graves right now because I said that. And uh, and I don't know, man. I I it's because of my kids. Mm. My kids want to go turkey hunting, and of course, I'm going to go turkey hunting with my kids. Right? My daughter wants to go shoot a. She. It's something that she is actively thinking about. And for a child to actively think about going and trying to kill a turkey, dude, that's that's a foot in the door to a lifelong outdoorsman right there. You know what I mean? And so I would be an absolute idiot to not go that direction with her. Right? I, I'm a deer hunter. I don't want to take my kid turkey hunting. That that's the stupid that would be stupid. And so I have to make sure that I am uh, fanning the flames, so to speak, about that. And so I, I'm just in my now that my son, uh, my oldest son, is old enough to probably come out, sit still with me or, or my stepdad out in the woods. Uh, I think it's time to take him. He's not going to have a tag this year. He's not going to shoot, but he will. Um, uh, he will sit and come out with us because he's interested in it. And I'm not going to go straight into hunting. My daughter, I didn't take her straight into hunting. I made her come out with me a couple of times, a couple of years. And then she got the opportunity to hunt last year was her first year with a tag. We got real close, but the cool thing about it was she failed, but she's still interested in, in going again, which that's a big deal, man. That's a huge deal. And to me, hats off to you, because in my opinion, which I know what they say about opinions, but in my opinion, the direction that you're taking that is the right direction with kids. I get sick and tired of seeing um, young kids that don't seem to have an interest, but they want to do something with dad. So what do they do? Dad takes them hunting and Mm -hmm. they, they can't do anything about learning. It's all about getting them to kill something. And I've seen kids that kill something and I don't even think they know what happened. They, they, yeah. they can't even appreciate what they did. And I'm not saying it's all bad, but it, it, like to me, like I can remember when I was a young kid, 
going with dad, not hunting and having experiences that drew more from me. And yeah. I'll never forget when I first started hunting and I had a failure and it like pissed me off as a little kid. And I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to overcome that. And then when I did it, the, the elation I had and that whole process, like, I, I feel like this instant gratification society that we live in for kids and hunting, I, I just, it, it's just per me personally, it throws a bad taste in my mouth. When, when a kid can go take a crossbow at five years old and shoot a big deer and literally all they did was pull the trigger. I just don't, I question, is that the right thing? I just personally, for me, I'm going to take it at my kid's pace and that's how yeah. I want to take it. Yeah. Which kind of leads me into another question. Oh, uh, by the way, we're not talking, we're not going to talk about habitat today. We we're down a different path and we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. A I'm all right time. with that. Uh, but um, my thoughts on parents who make the first hunt or the first buck too easy right so um i had a i had a guy on a while ago uh i want to say maybe a year or two ago and he shot his first buck that he ever shot was it might have been with a crossbow and it was like a 177 inch buck and so i asked him i go hey man what was it like hunting all of those years your first buck your first buck as a 13 year old or a 14 year old was 177 inch giant whitetail. What were the next 10 years like after that? And he goes, they sucked. They, they absolutely suck. And then he had to take, he took time off and he stopped hunting. It was because his first deer. And I, I think he, he even mentioned that his dad put him on it. Right. Which for the dad, the dad is thinking, hey, man, that's an awesome, I'm going to give my kid something that I don't even have yet or, you know, whatever. And so, but the, the, the kid shot the deer and then he's like, there wasn't another deer of that caliber or size in 15 years. And so the next five years, I slowly slipped out of hunting because I kept comparing everything to that first big buck. And it was the, he, and he even said it was the worst possible thing that could happen. I should have shot a fork horn or a spike or a button buck or a doe that first year, but you know, who's going to turn down a, a 170 coming through the woods. Right. And so he, he shot it and then he just admitted that man, the, the next handful of years, they absolutely sucked because I, I kept comparing what I had on trail camera and what I was seeing in the woods to that first year. And there was nothing that can compare to it. So I have a buddy that his daughter, uh, she was, I want to say she was somewhere between 13 and 15 years old at the time. And for the first time ever, she's like, dad, I kind of want to go deer hunting with you. And he's like, yeah. okay. So he bought her a brand new deer rifle mm -hmm. and took her out hunting and the, the property they were hunting. There was some food plots and there's all this and that stuff. And there was one deer in particular that year that I'm going to say probably if i had to guess he was going to gross in the 140s guess maybe he was like a four-year-old deer he was a heck of a deer and this property like the guys that were managing or hunting this property they were like hey i really think because this deer hangs on us a lot i really think he's got potential to get to five years old so therefore i, I really think all of us that you know have deer we're, we're going to pass this deer give it give him that pass and they and we they all agreed like that, that's what they're going to do. So the opening day of Pennsylvania rifle season, um, my buddy who's hunting this property takes his daughter and it was he, his daughter and his dad, they're all together for the first time, three generations sitting together and they're sitting in this food plot. And wouldn't you know it, this 140 inch 10 pointer walks out in the field 30 yards from them and feeds. And to let the story go on, he did not let his daughter shoot that deer. Yeah. And later that night, shot she shot a six pointer. And there's a couple of ways you can look at this, but this is my opinion and you know, take it for what it is. She was just as excited to mm -hmm. shoot that six pointer. She she would have had zero appreciation 
for what she killed to kill that 10 point or 140 inch deer for somebody that had invested in it. And you could say that's ugly. And I agree. Like when, when, when he tells the story to people who don't understand whitetail hunting or, you know, that dynamic or that culture, they're like, that's ridiculous that you wouldn't, that, that, that you wouldn't let her shoot that. Maybe so. But at the same time, the experience that they had with those three generations together that night in that blind with that six pointer, that was a memory they won't forget. And it accomplished two goals because the next year, I think somebody shot that buck and accomplished their goal, the biggest buck of their life. But all that to say, she's not hunting right now. So what difference would it have made in that situation? Would that have retained her if she shot a bigger buck? I don't, based on what you just shared with me with that list, with that guest you had on, I don't think it would have made a difference in hunter retention. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think there is a little bit of mystique around the next year's bigger buck, right? Because that's that's what I've done throughout my, I guess, the course of my hunting career is I've tried to stair step right i i didn't necessarily go through the it's brown it's down phase but i definitely went through if it's 140 it's 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 getting an arrow right, right. and now i'm not shooting 140s right and now i'm focused on okay i need uh i want an older more mature white tail which is just uh, a tricky way of saying i want bigger antlers true right? and so you know if a 180 inch three-year-old comes through I'm shooting a three-year-old. Okay. Uh, don't, don't get anything twisted about that. Right. I, like age means nothing if the rack is big enough. And I think a lot of people would, agree, would, would maybe disagree with that statement, but then shoot that buck. You know what I mean? And so, um, ages, age, ages, age is only important as the antlers are big if that makes any sense at all. So, so it does. And for a lot of people, yeah. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And it, it, again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If that's what somebody wants to do, why do you care if it doesn't affect you? Why do you yeah. have an opinion or have to bring somebody down in that case, if that's what they want to do vice versa to the guy who is growing the maximum quality deer and stuff. Why mm -hmm. does he have a say in another hunter that wants to shoot a hundred inch two-year-old who yeah. freaking cares? Do what makes you happy. I just gave a yeah. presentation the other week and uh, it was all around food plots. And, you know, I talked about some failures that I commonly see in food plots and it was, uh, you know, from soil aspects and crop management. But then the, the, the big failure that I typically see in a situation like that is not setting your property up with food plots appropriately to hold mature bucks. And I, I made this disclaimer. I said, look, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about mature bucks. I said, mm -hmm. now my disclaimer is I could care less what anybody shoots. If the first legal buck that walks in the gun range for you or bow range for you makes you happy shoot that deer don't let any human being tell you you shouldn't say that but i said i'm also going to say i do know a lot of people get to a point where they say they want to see bigger and better yeah. and if if you're looking to think you can't make a difference you can here's some things that helped me and, yeah. and kind of treated it that way i just think that's so important at this point in time yeah you know I I, I, here's what I will admit. I will admit I've said some things in this last 10 years of podcasting and content that have gone against what other people believe. Or, I mean, no, no, there's nobody out there that's going to agree with you 100% on all your opinions about everything. Right. And, and I've said some things that in the past that I don't necessarily regret saying because at the time of saying them, I, I, that's what I believed, but it is okay to not necessarily flip flop your opinions, but change your opinions based off age, based off of experience, based off of the knowledge and information and things like that. And so I think, um, a lot of my opinions change throughout the course of, uh, you know, a decade as, you know, as far as how I approach hunting, what I think hunting's all about my, um, my thoughts and opinions on the hunting culture and the hunting industry and things like that. And so it's always changing. I mean, that's life, right? It's ever evolving. And so 
um, my, my thoughts and, and approaches towards certain things are always evolving as well. That's the only constant in life is that everything's changing. I mean, I shared with you on the phone one time about some changes that I've had in my own personal hunting, like the, the places I hunted mm -hmm. then versus now. There's some differences, and most of it revolves around the fact that I'm in a different place in my life. And I, I think the time that I can associate to something and what makes it fun has has a big impact. Like There was a time mm -hmm. when I had more time on my hands. I was all in to pass every single buck to get to a certain age class or a certain caliber of deer and, and do things around a property. Like I was all about that and I still am. But the problem is um, I'm not going to do something that conflicts with somebody else's interest. If it's their, if it's their property. So I, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I enjoy doing. And if that means hunting different properties and shooting a little bit smaller deer, but I, that's what I have time to do and can dedicate to. And that's what's, my own personal thought. I'm going to do that. It's, it's, yeah. that's what makes it fun. Yeah. I think over the next 10 years, and I'm just, this is a guess at this point. Okay. So the last 10 years, now it's the next 10 years. I think I'm just going to stop caring about everything and just go out and hunt for fun and get my kids involved for fun and, 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 because ultimately, I think if I teach my kids that the destination is inches and big antlers, then all I'm doing is creating additional problems for the whitetail, the future of the whitetail community in North America. And so I have to educate my kids that, you know, hunting is supposed to be fun. Hunting is, is supposed to, it's supposed to mean something more than a number, right? And I can't like, I don't want my kids to fall into the same rut that I've fallen into before where it's like, God, I need, I need to shoot a big buck, right? I want to shoot a big buck only. I'm just blessed that I live in Iowa and we got yeah. big bucks. You know what I mean? And so, um, I don't know. It's, it's just, I think about all these things all the time, uh, along with all the other thoughts that are running through my head. And I just try not to worry. I try to go through life and just enjoy every possible moment because there is an end, right? There is an end to this world that we live in. And, uh, you know, despite the facts or despite what you believe, what happens after death, there's an end here. And I just want to enjoy every opportunity and every moment with the people that I love the most. So good point there. So you talk about the last 10 years and, you know, the chase, big deer. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's been me and I still, I'm still, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna act like I'm not, I'm immune to that. Now I still think about, I'm, I'm always looking at big deer, thinking about big deer. I want to shoot a big deer and put them on my wall and look at them and tell the story. Yep. I'm the same way, but yep. you, well, you're talking about like this next 10 years, you're talking about the, the image that you portray hunting and the, and life that you portray hunting to your kids. Mm -hmm. And that's a much different message than you probably have portrayed at one point in your life through the podcast earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my question then would be when you think about, um, if you pull the family aspect, when you just think about podcast message, I mean, the hunting industry has done a great job of getting us to be better hunters and better information and stepping the bar up there. And it's led us down this rabbit hole to where we're at now. So when you think about the next 10 years of the Nine Finger Chronicles podcast, how do you envision or want to see that message get changed in light of what we're talking about now with listeners and that positive aspect of hunting? Yeah. So, that's a great question. Be and here's the deal. Everybody's goals are different. And I, I, I heard a little hot take. Or it's not a hot take. It was just someone's opinion. And I, I don't blame them for having this opinion. And it, the whole the whole point of that this conversation was, you know, someone was kind of getting demonized by the by others within the hunting community about only wanting to shoot big antler deer right hey dude if that's your goal and you you want to dream it and you want to accomplish it that's cool man that is awesome but there is a little bit of a conversation about the greater good that i think all of us are missing and that is in order to get deer to a higher aid to, to grow big antlers here's what you need 
you need to have them survive for longer periods of time, straight up. You need to have places where they feel safe, habitat improvement. You need to have trigger control, uh, right? You need to have um, a little bit larger acreage in order for that deer to live and survive and have food for where he doesn't need to go anywhere else. He needs to stay on that property. And, and that's what it, all this habitat work is, is, is for. Right. And then, then we have to say, okay, what does it take to do that? It takes land and it takes less hunters per acre in order to accomplish that goal. Right. And so in order to get big bucks, with big antlers, which is the goal for even me these days. There's there have to be less hunters per acre. There has to have there have to be a mentality where I'm gonna pass like in, in the area that I hunt, dude, people are passing five year old 180 inch deer every single year. I'll never do that. But that's what I'm taught I'm saying is that's that's the norm in certain parts of Iowa. Okay. And so in order, in order to accomplish the goal, you have to have, I mean, it's, it's, it's simple. It's just less hunters per acre. Right. And so now a, a single hunter is taking up more acres, which the reason they're doing it is for big antlers. Right. And so the whole greater good here is now we have a smaller hunting community just so certain people can, and then they're like, well, what about public land? That's great. Public, public land is awesome. Go hunt public land until you're running in to all of the people who used to be on private and I'll fast forwarding several years here that can't afford leases, that can't afford to buy their own farms. Now they're shifting to public because it's their last chance. Now they are running into other hunters who have been kicked off and displaced. And now that experience of hunting public land is not as good. And so now people are, are quitting. And that's happening right now across North America. Whether you believe it or not, it's happening. People, hunters are being displaced and they're not coming back to it, right? And I, I'm not saying this is, a, I had a conversation with a, a, a turkey biologist and I said, what's the problem with wild turkey? And he's like, there's not one problem that's causing their decline in numbers. It is death by a thousand cuts, mm -hmm. right? And so big antlers is not necessarily the only reason why hunting is um, happening because it's a cultural thing, but the culture drives decision making. And, and when you have a culture that is 100% focused on big bucks and that, that drives the culture, then all there, there, is, there is a downstream effect to those decisions. And I'm part of the problem. Other, like, I don't, I don't, it's, it's hard to explain because I want big bucks too, because they're cool, dude. Big bucks are cool, but are big bucks so cool that it will undermine the future of hunting, you know, to where it's a, a pay to play system or only those who can afford leases can afford outfitting, can afford uh, large chunks of land. You know, it's, it's hard to hate on people for having a dream because I, I want to be a landowner someday. But at the same time, you, you realize that big antlers and big old mature bucks that we all talk about, big mature bucks, there's more to it than, than that. Well, and it's tough for me, too, because when you talk about private land, leased land, owned land, all that stuff, and then habitat management, food plots and all that stuff to make better, higher quality hunting, I grew up doing that. Like mm -hmm. that is in my blood and I, I'm not going to lie. Like, of course the, the cool thing now in hunting content is to, to take a crap on that because that's not cool. Nobody cares about any of that. I, I right. don't know why, because the level of work that goes into that versus the, the scouting people talk about, they do in public. I know there's some hardcore hunters out there that do a lot of boot leather and scouting and are really in depth. I also know there's a lot that think they do a lot and then want to talk trash on somebody who works their freaking tail off on their property or works their tail off in their general life in order to afford that and be able to have that. 
I, I my my hat is off to that person. I mm -hmm. love doing like for those who've right. never experienced it to be able to work with the ground and the land and manipulate it for a positive outcome for wildlife. That is flipping awesome. But there, there's one deviating thing between all this, and it's 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 the almighty dollar, because when you earn the almighty dollar, they're investing their money into that. Why would they let somebody else do it? And it, it can make some ugly decisions like we're talking about. I mean, we're, we're never going to figure it out. The, the reality is, is whatever your goals are, you got to you got to chase the setting in which you can do that if you're if you can't if you're going to hunt public land in pennsylvania you need to curb your expectations if you think you're going to be killing 180 inch deer and yeah. I, I think that's also flawed to say well we need to be uh setting it up in a manner or having enough land that we can get that it's probably not realistic it's probably going to cost way too much for us to be able to do that efficiently but yeah. I don't know. We're talking about something you and I are never going to figure out. We're never going to have the answers no. to. Nobody ever will. And it's just, it's, it's walking just, this razor's edge, right? I mean, it, it is, it's one of these things where it's, how do you tell a group of people? Well, I'll, I'm going to ask a question and I want you to answer it. What do you feel that people who own land are, are responsible for the natural resource that everybody gets to enjoy? <clears throat> Never thought about it that way. So, I don't know how I want to answer Stewards. that. Stewards. I mean, you know, yeah. we, hear, we, we hear the word steward thrown around, like uh, in some of these stewardship uh, programs that are available, and they teach people about the land. Yeah. Right. And how the land can be, you know, you can manipulate your your land for yeah. better habitat, not just for deer, but for all wildlife, snakes and ants and bugs and pollinators, whatever the case is. And and so they do that because they want to see wildlife thrive on their property. Thus, they are stewards for wildlife. Right. And so when it comes, people are doing that and then hunting on their own property. Great. Awesome. But in a way, do you feel there is responsibility there for someone who owns land to also allow people who do not have access to ground or good access to ground to come hunt on their property to save the future of hunting? Gotcha. Now I understand what you're talking about. Yeah. And and this is a harsh answer but my answer is absolutely not because mm -hmm. there you are getting down a road um you're you're basically talking about free handouts like what our government is trying to do in our daily life and to me that is bs so do i think that somebody who owns land works their tail off um like like they should feel obligated to 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 to, to hand out to the neighborhood no i, I don't yeah i and yeah, that's harsh. And what what I would want to put on my heart is that I'm sure because talk about the purpose of hunting. What purpose does hunting have for Mitchell? Mm -hmm. um, w w when I die and you look at this bear behind me and, you know, I've got this beautiful 170 inch Pennsylvania buck and all these th this different game animals. When I die, does any of that matter? No, it means Zippo, nada, nil. But what would be cool is if I can look at some of these deer antlers in remembrance and say, hey, you know what, that experience, not only was it a cool hunting experience, but it also had an impact on somebody else because of the hunting experience we shared. Or when I think about uh, if I go to a friend's house or somebody else who sends me a picture and says, hey, this was an inspiration and this this was important like that is the part that's the purposeful part that's important so roll that into your question about should somebody allow people to hunt their property i would like to say that the what we've been talking about most of this time is that the the happiness the enjoyment is in the adventure itself and the experience itself and if if you can't find fulfillment in helping others and do that and it's all self-interest yeah there's a problem with that so really the problem we're talking about is not necessarily the the um the working government so to speak overhead it's more like uh 
what's in your heart kind of deal. And I know it's getting mm-hmm. a little deep, but that that's my take on it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Um, my, it, the devil's advocate. I mean, that was a devil's advocate question. Oh, absolutely. Right? I, I, and so another devil's advocate question is the natural resource belongs to the state. Right. I mean, they're, they're the people who manage it, supposedly. And so when the natural reese, like when, you, you know, private landowners, they have they have the natural resource on their land. And so let's say, for example, public lands, the states start to sell public land. This is all hypothetical. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. Like th- this will never happen. I don't know whether or not it happens or not. Well, we've seen it. Right. States. Some states sell off public land to get some money so they can put it back into the state and pay for whatever, whatever. We've seen it happen before. Um, public land becomes overrun. The natural resource is uh, all on private now. And now the people who own land get to benefit from the way things are now. And so then people who don't have access to private land don't get to experience the natural resource anymore. They don't, they don't get to experience hunting. That's of course, again, before people shit on me, this is hypothetical. These are devil's advocate questions, but then at what point is it? it, And from the sounds of it, it's not the landowner's responsibility. I worked hard. I bought land. I get to enjoy the state's natural resource on my land. I get to do whatever I want to do on my property. As long as I abide by the rules and regulations of the state on how, like what I can do, what I, how I can hunt, stuff like that. And so it's just, again, these are all things that I think about as far as the future. And I feel like a lot of it is driven by antler size. I I don't necessarily disagree with that. Um, You talked about the, the, the state owning the land and everything else having impact. I think there's some states that do a much better job of managing their natural resources than other states. And I'm going to give you the perfect example. When you look here in my neck of the woods, you compare Pennsylvania's bear management to New Jersey's bear management. You want to talk about a world of difference? There, there's, there's play, New Jersey had a closed bear season for almost five years, not because there was an, there was an issue with their, 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 you know, low bear numbers or something from that. It was purely emotionally driven and there was piss poor leaders involved making decisions that were based on emotion and not on data and science. And then you have special interest groups that are in charge of public land, certain aspects. It's it's under the, it's owned by the state of New Jersey. However, it's controlled by a special interest group. Then, then we'll make things that says, yes, but even though this is public land and you guys can all free use it, uh, we don't want anybody to bear hunt on it because we don't feel that that is a, uh, an issue within the resources here. Are you kidding me? So really what it comes down to is, and uh, I hate to, I hate to tell you it comes down to money and it comes down to piss poor leadership and we're not going to fix that. This is a this is the, the the era of our life where it's going to keep getting worse. I hate to tell you and whether you believe it or not. But I mean, I always make the joke. Or it's not a joke. It's the truth. I always say I've read the book of Revelation. And when you read stuff like that, it kind of highlights that it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This world we live in is is a is a game show i mean it is it's it's so crazy uh, but i going back to that new jersey bear i think i was watching somebody you know they they had all you know they stopped bear hunting in new jersey the the bear population started to get out of control and then i like some lady standing on her front porch recording two bears viciously fight each other over trash over a trash can Yep. You know, they were both going to a trash can and then they started fighting over it and there was people in the area. And so, yes, bears are cute and they're emotional. We should not hunt them until they grab you. And then it's a completely different story. Well, it's reactionary instead yeah. of being proactive. Think about the wolves. I don't, well, you just had Troy Pottinger talk about this. I, I like to yeah. listen to Troy when I can. He talked about the same concept with wolves in Idaho. We had the same thing happen with bears in New Jersey. To give you an idea of what it was like, Dan, we hunted. Um, they had a week-long bear season in October. First half was archery only. The second half of the week was archery and muzzleloader. So four of us went. 
um, over that time frame. I believe it was in four days of hunting, three of us combined saw 34 bear sightings in three days. Yeah. Now, for, for, you know, that might not sound like a lot to you, but for somebody coming from the Northeast to go to an area like that, that is absolutely ridiculous. And, and the, yeah. the, the level of bear sign and damage and the folks you talk to and the experiences they had, to me, that is all piss poor management from a state to realize that. And then when you have responses coming through that say, we're going to, we're going to use non-lethal measures. I mean, there's been so much data that says non-lethal measures do not work in, in managing wildlife. And yet there's still idiots out there. And I'm getting a little feisty. There's still idiots out there that, that want to instill this into our government and our practices for our natural resources. Come on guys. Yeah. This conversation this conversation could never end. Like we could no, just, it, it wouldn't. We could just keep talking for hours. It wouldn't. Hours so, what positive thing do we want to talk about to end it? Do you like meatloaf? I love meatloaf. Why? Dude, I love meatloaf. <laughs> I love. I don't know. You said. You said. You said. Let's talk about something positive. <laughs> I don't know why, but the first thing that popped into my head, and I say whatever I think, meatloaf. Dude, I love. So, I love well, a good so make sure I get meatloaf. this straight. Let me make sure I get this straight. If it was 25-year-old Dan, he probably would have said, do you like sex? But at 42 years old, you say, do you like meatloaf? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I, I, dude, dude, don't get me wrong. I'm 43, and I still like sex. But, <laughs> but the older I get, the more, the more meatloaf sounds intriguing. <laughs> so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back. So at the beginning of this, you asked me what makes me happy. If I could lay out the perfect scenario, I'm going to work my tail off. I'm going to purchase land, which I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm going to purchase mm. land, and then I'm going to do everything we were just talking about and saying creates problems. I'm going to do it and be part of the problem. But you know what? That's what makes me happy because I enjoy doing it. And I, it, it gives me a, a playing ground, even if it's 20 acres, it's a playing ground, a place for me to go hide and have a little bit of solitude, involve my kids, involve my friends, involve family, involve whoever I want it, into that grand scheme of, of things. That would, that's like, like from the hunting side of things and you want to curb your mentality of from hunting, what makes you happy? That would truly, that would be a, a happy thing because um, I'm not doing it. I wouldn't be necessarily doing at this point in my life for self-fulfillment. I would realize that any of the increase in that situation I would give to, to God because that's yeah. just where I'm at. But um, I, I would, I would love to be part of that hunting wise, but that yeah. that's, that's kind of what we're to answer your question. We're talking about this. I, I feel like I have to be realistic and not sound like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm above everybody else. I'm part of the problem too. Get off your high horse, Mitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, dude, I get it. Uh, everybody's got their own deal. And, you know, I, I definitely can't can't uh, blame them for everybody wanting different things. And so there's no right answer. Uh, hunting still makes me happy. The outdoors still makes me happy. Um, big bucks still make me happy. Absolutely. My kids, my, my kids still make me happy. And so I think that's a great place to end this podcast, man. Uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk about habitat a different day. And now we're gonna have to schedule a second podcast. Uh, and, and and actually, there will be like there will be no distracting BS session up front. We're gonna go right to habitat, and that way we don't get distracted by these other conversations. So that way, Mitch hey, doesn't go on any tangents. Hey, that was two of us, man. So Mitch, man, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.